All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this session. Uh, so what is uh, growth hacking? So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, growth hacking your community or how do you hire people, how do you create a, a community around your business or your uh, community or your initiatives, if you have any initiatives that you, you um, uh, lead uh, on your so personal uh, capacity so or you your it. company or your uh, interest group or whatever. Um, I learned about growth hacking uh, very early uh, when the internet was starting up. I, one of the first businesses I started was uh, web development. And what I learned very early on is web is a very dynamic space. Even though when we started developing websites and that kind of stuff, it was very um, uh, uh, early days. There was no animation. There's no engagement with the user. There was the only thing that was animated in the early days was GIFs, which is our animated photos that you see all the memes that are <laughs> they're using it. Um, so uh, it was very hard to determine how many people visit your website if a certain portion of your website was actually more visited than others so and we had something called w stat and we used to check all the you know the clicks on what and i used to write small scripts that actually uh, find out what is working and what is not working and i found out uh, there is a sweet spot of uh, really recognizing what really works and that sweet spot was about a period of 2 weeks so if you measure how many people use your website in a certain way for two weeks, you can come in the next week and try something new and measure again what's happening uh, with the visitors. You get more visitors doing it this way, and you can experiment a lot with it. And I did that for a really long time, I think maybe at least three or four years, until um, I recognized, okay, there's a lot of money to be made uh, for domain names, because there's something that came up with the new search engines at the time, like... Uh, uh, Google and, and others that uh, were focusing on uh, something called SEO, which is search engine optimization, and the domain name itself was playing a bigger role than the content, because they were looking, uh, their ratio uh, was looking more at the domain name and then the content. So I was like, okay, there's a lot of opportunity in here, and I started playing around with change, uh, getting really descriptive domain names for businesses, uh, like for example, if I wanted a growth hacking business, I would just say growthhacking.com, .net, .org. There were only those top three domain names. And as soon as you get that, and that brings a whole lot of legitimacy and traffic to your website. And it was a bigger effect than the actual content and playing around with the content and positioning, uh, positioning and uh, highlighting of the content within the page. So uh, I, I did that, uh, and then I learned about blogging and a lot of things about blogging and a lot of things about social media and you can measure every single, single thing. So what is, what is uh, growth hacking? Growth hacking is moving the whole time. You always try to market, try to improve uh, the, the message you send to the audience. It's continuously uh, um, uh, changing your message around, continuously being on the edge, look forward looking, trying to anticipate what the next thing is. So you should always start yourself. So uh, there's a, a book called The Art of War, and it says, uh, what, it's in Chinese, so I'll try to translate it uh, the best I can. So it says, to know yourself, you win. So, uh, to, to know your enemy, you win some battles. To know yourself and your enemy, you win uh, the war, basically. Uh, so first thing before you do any growth hacking is understand your capabilities and that kind of stuff. So how do you start? The one of the best ways to start to understand yourself is understanding your DNA. I know this, a lot of people will think well, this is too far-fetched, but it is actually true. To understand your DNA, you understand your weaknesses, your strengths, you understand a lot of things about yourself that you didn't know before. It's just like getting a dashboard of what you are and how you work, basically. Are you better in understanding certain things than other people? Uh, you, and then you capitalize, this, like, like I mentioned with the website, you capitalize on the things that uh, you are good at. And the things that you are not good at, you can work harder at them maybe, or maybe you can try different things to learn um, how to improve that weakness that you have. But without having a baseline in the beginning, you will not know how to move forward. 
So once you understand what is your baseline, once you understand your, uh, what you, what your strengths and weaknesses, what is the quickest way to learn? Uh, this is a, uh, um, he's a boyer and an archer. So what does that mean? It has a, uh, he uses actually a bow and arch to shoot targets, but sitting on a horse that is moving, and he's usually doing it almost standing up on a horse. And the targets can be moving targets as well, can be stationary targets, can be above your head. And every culture in the world does it differently. And they have competitions in Japan and Turkey and Mongolia, all of them testing the same thing. Archery while you're on a horse that's actually in motion. And imagine, even if you have a gun, think of it as a gun. Gun is a very precise instrument. You're shooting a gun from a horse, it's almost impossible to hit the target. They're using an archery, you know, bow and arch on a horse that's moving and, and move, constantly moving and hitting a small target that's actually moving itself, maybe in the opposite direction as well. So how do you get bit better at this? One of the ways, and this is, uh, you have to measure yourself all the time, but one of the quickest ways is to ask an ex expert, right? One of the better ways is to ask an expert if he was to choose a guy for me to learn from, who would be the guy that would teach me the fastest? So if you go to the expert, the expert is a very bad thing to do. If you go to the expert, he will teach you the long way how to do things. But you ask, if you ask him who learned the fastest, and you go learn from that guy, you will not only learn faster, but you will learn in a more efficient way, because he will cut out all the junk that's, you know, that is not needed. And one of some of the best people in the world in this very complicated sport uh, were uh, Westerners because they learned from scratch. They learned by the people who learned it very quickly, and they actually did something extra. This example, this guy example, did something uh, very very unique. It's not unique to him, but it's a very nice approach actually. So you can see he adjusted, he changed the saddle, he changed the way he uh, leans forward, he changed his whole body position. He made his own bows and arches. Why do you need all that? Because this is trial and error. If you buy ready-made bows and arches, you will not really learn, you will not be able to adjust everything from the materials, from, from the elasticity of the thing, from the uh, shape of the bow, from the each kind of sport will, or within this, which kind, each kind of culture within the sport will need a different kind of bow and arch, and uh, if you don't make it yourself, you will not have that much control, and you will not have that measurement that you try something, you measure, you try something, and you measure, and very quickly, much, much faster. The, for example, the people in Japan spend years to learn how to do it on a stand stationary target while they're moving in a set track. You have to notice also something that he's not even holding the horse. The horse is on uh, auto autopilot, actually. <laughs> With a certain speed and getting only that speed and the understanding between you and the horse is only is by itself a huge undertaking. And in Japan, you have to, if that wasn't hard enough, you have to wear a funny pink hat. So another thing, another concept with the growth hacking is the least effective dose. So what do you do usually when you try to do something? You try not to increase your variables. And one of the best things to do that, especially for improving your body, is basically doing the least effective dose. So even exercising the least amount and getting the best results. Uh, when you're having uh, nutrition, uh, taking supplements, you shouldn't take 20 supplements. You should take the supplements that are very precise to you. And again, we go back to the DNA. If you know your DNA, you know exactly which supplements you take, and you know exactly what's the minimum effective dose to take in those supplements. And that's true for your business as well. You do the minimum marketing that has the most effect. Some people call it the 80-20 rule. You focus on the people that will, you know, uh, take action. So if you're inviting people to the event, you don't invite a million people. You First of all, you will invite a million people because it's on the Internet. But then you have to target the people that usually come to your events, usually attend, and usually actually spread the word about your events. And how do you know that? You create custom links, you create custom channels where you can actually measure how many people come. You create uh, invite links that are different for each channel that you have and things like that. With doing that, with targeted and measuring the targeted uh, campaigns, you can actually do much, much better in improving your, your community. So we come to the community part. Who are the best people in the world? Does anybody know? 
Who is the best growth hacking guy in the world? Some people will say some guy like uh, Gary Vee. I would say no. The guy that won the best vote in the world or the hardest war vote to win in the world, Donald Trump. <laughs> He's one of the best growth hackers in the world. He has some, a lot of people don't like him, right? But everyone in the world knows who he is. He does very, very, very uh, strategic uh, tw- tweets on the internet. He used to do it even before he was the president. He used to do it to win the presidency. The, the thing that people criticize him the most with was influencing the media. And guess what? One of the first things he did as soon, as soon as he took over the office, he flipped it. He flipped it and said, oh, the media is actually creating something uh, called fake news. When he created that, he all introduced this doubt into the people's, uh, you know, uh, sense making, saying that, oh, I know about fake news. Fake news are, are, are people who are doing it against Trump. Otherwise, why would he be insistent on it? And he would do something really nice in, in uh, growth hacking, which is uh, putting in something very weak. So he will do, he will say maybe three or four things that are really nice, and intentionally he will say something very racist after that. And he would be actually measuring each, uh, uh, you know, response from each of those um, uh, releases or tweets or something like that. And even the bad one will sometimes get more results. It doesn't matter if it's negative or positive. The more eyes on the on the tweet, the better for him. And then he would correct it the next tweet, and then he will release three, four really nice thoughts, and he will measure that how much how much uh, people respond to it, and he will measure the sentiment. People wrote something positive about it, negative, liked it or disliked it or whatever, and he would continuously continuously measure that, and know what what to do in reaction. And it is obviously working for him. He, he became the president. Not the pop, most popular president, but he did become the president. So one of the questions that people ask about uh, growth hacking your community is basically, uh, which do you choose? Which platform do you start with? The answer for that is very simple. You start with one, measure. If it doesn't work for you, you move on to the next one. Whether it's videos, whether it's podcasts, whether it's YouTube, whether it's uh, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, or whatever. And one of the key points is choosing the right people, choosing the people who are creative. I use this uh, as an interview question. I ask people, what is this uh, and what can you do with it? Most of people will say, this is a brick and we can build stuff with it, right? The people who think outside the box are the ones that you should hire. People who tell you creative answers about this. Uh, They ask you, for example, uh, how big is this brick? I cannot see the dimension. The, the, the things that normal people will uh, see is not the people you want to hire. You want the people who will actually dig deeper and try to understand what is this and cre- give you very creative answers to this brick. I will not give you any hints, but think about it. <laughs> and uh, even when we teach in our classes, we experiment all the time with new ways of, of teaching. Uh, for example, this is a very hands-on uh, class about blockchain, and we explain blockchain using tissue box and a piece of paper, and that tissue box. That uh, shows the concept. Of, and then we have an actual physical iron chain to show people uh, the, that concept. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, growth hacking is, uh, uh, and very important thing is how you pick your team. And one of the things that we always try to do is create a, a very high barrier for entry. What that, what that means is whenever you, somebody applies for a job, you make it really hard for him, even if you like him, you make it really hard for him to actually uh, get accepted. The reason for that is uh, the people who are not driven, the people who are not serious about applying for your job will actually be deterred and just apply somewhere else. Uh, uh, when I was uh, uh, studying uh, my bachelor's, I went to this magic shop, and this magic shop guy refused to sell me the magic, and he told me, oh, you live in a different city. I'll give you another magic shop in that city. You can buy it from there. And the first time I went there, there was no shop. You gave me the wrong address. So I came back to him next time, a week or two after, and I told him, look, you gave me the wrong address. He said, uh, did you go there? I said, yeah, I went there. And we didn't have internet or anything at that time. So it took me 45 minutes to go back to him and ask him what is the right address. 
And I went back to him and I told him, you gave me the wrong address. And he said, there is no magic shop in your city. Did you even look it up? I said, yeah, I looked it up. There's nothing. He said, look, 90% of the people who wanted to do magic will actually be deterred and never even come back. Just the fact that you came back means that you are actually interested in this. And the last but not least, when you pick a team, you always should pick a team that's peaceful, a team that can work together like an, like an orchestra. They are driven, like I said, creative, and can work together. You can have the best teams, the best team in the world, the best community in the world, but if everyone's fighting each other, like we're seeing in the Bitcoin community right now, it is very hard to have pro- progress. You have to think like one team. You have to work forward like one team. You have to really support each other. And you can be from different, you know, capabilities, different ethnicities, different um, backgrounds. But as long as you can get along towards the same goal, you will always succeed. Thank you very much. And if you want uh, the notes from that talk, is here. And I think it's also shared on the uh, Hack in the Box. Yeah, it will be available later on on the Hack in the Box website. Thank you, Mr. Marwan. Uh, I think you did a great job on squeezing this into 15 minutes. Thank you very much. It was amazing to, and I think it will help people make their organization grow better.